on to the session today. Our panel discussion is on the topic, the future of work, um, AI red teaming, and how AI red teaming is the future of AI. Um, uh, the concept is around why AI red teaming is important, how one can make it happen at the workplace, and how HR can be an essential part of it. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are probably new to the concept, so we will be launching a poll uh, just to get a sense of how many of you are already familiar with it. Um, we have three panelists. Um, uh, when the poll is launched, you can answer it on your screen, but let's move on and get to know our excellent panelists who, in my opinion, are like a dream team uh, for this topic. Um, so let's start with Noel. Noel is uh, Chief AI Officer at uh, AI Leadership Institute and also the founder of AI Leadership Institute. Noel specializes in um, helping uh, companies with data, cloud, conversational AI, generative AI, and LLMs. And as you can sense, she's a technical um, sort of a strong lead here. Uh, Noel has led teams at NPR, Microsoft, IBM, AWS, and Amazon Alexa. She's the founder of I Love AI Community uh, that teaches responsible AI for everyone. Uh, great to have you here, Noel. I'm thrilled that we got you, that we were able to get you for this conference. Um, and along with Noel, we have Kate Scholfin. Uh, Kate is a PhD in industrial organizational psychology um, and senior leadership trainer, as well as a team lead at Life Labs Learning. Uh, Kate works with leaders and teams across global companies as a facilitator. Uh, she's the moderator and creator of uh, the HR, AI plus HR series, which uh, Life Labs hosts for a global community of HR professionals. Um, Kate has a background in psychology, um, uh, leadership development, and research on resilience. And therefore, I think she brings a unique perspective to the intersection of AI and HR. Um, and again, Kate, super glad to have you here. And like I said, uh, this is a dream team uh, because of the various perspectives that all three of you bring. Which brings me to Diane um, sadowski Joseph, our third panelist. Uh, Diane is the co-founder and head of product at Apply AI. Um, she's um, seasoned in driving organizational performance through leadership development and uh, more recently AI integration. Um, as a startup executive, Diane has scaled the company from eight people to a nine-figure acquisition with record-level employee engagement and NPS. Uh, she's also studied AI strategy at UC Berkeley. Um, and now she has co-founded a venture, uh, an AI venture that revolutionizes how organizations expand their AI capabilities in a human first way. So welcome all three of you. I'm sure it's already clear why the why the conversation around a red teaming is going to be super uh, rich uh, with the three of them. And um, thank you everyone for answering the poll. Just just uh, a quick look at it. Most people are not familiar at all with the red teaming and uh, I wasn't either. I had to read it up uh, for this panel. Um, and uh, very few are planning to um, uh, engage with it um, anytime soon. So let's start the session. And my first question is to Noel. Um, I want to start at the basics and we'd love for you to tell us what AI red teaming is. Um, and why do you think it's crucial for organizations as well as the future of work to have AI red teaming as a part of their deep, their work? Can you see me okay? Yes. Oh, okay, great. Because I don't see my little green light is normally on. I don't see it. So good to see you, everybody. Uh, so glad you're here. Um, yeah, I think this is a, a really important concept because it's definitely, you know, the concept of AI red teaming, it stems from cybersecurity. So for those of you who know a little bit about cybersecurity or maybe have heard about red teaming and from a cyber perspective, it adopts a lot of those same philosophies. Like you need a team of people who are just going to attack, like ethically attack your system to see, is it resilient? Can it sustain? Will it give away data? Um, in the world of generative AI though, that that world and really in the world of AI holistically, that has changed quite a bit. And so we're now in this world where not only, of course, like cyber tends to be focused on technical attacks, right? People building malware, writing software. Today, those attacks can come just through human language, just the way people talk, <laughs> just by someone saying something in a way that you didn't uh, imagine or you didn't 
predict. Like, it's, so it's incredibly um, challenging. Uh, so, so the good news is, is that this concept of red teaming is actually more of a verb. It's not a noun. It's not a thing you, you are. It's a thing you do. And I think that's really important. But to give you a, just a high level understanding so that we can dive into it with uh, my fellow panelists as to why you all, you, you as an audience will want to be involved is that red teaming when it comes to AI is about really bringing in lived experience, diverse and inclusive lived experience and using those lived experiences to extract out bias in systems. How do we know? Like, um, So for those of you who don't know, I started uh, my journey into AI 10 years ago. I was uh, employee 10 on the uh, uh, Amazon Alexa team. So I got a chance to kind of start building these systems before everyone was, you know, all in on it uh, quite yet. Um, but I went from Amazon to Microsoft and launched a bunch of models there. And one thing, oh my gosh, I get to share with you in my one more minute of, of sharing. Um, I have this cute little baby tiger and this baby tiger, I kind of grabbed onto this idea because at Microsoft and at Amazon, when we started building these models, we had basically a baby tiger. It was super cute. Everyone was like, this model is so awesome. I love it. Um, no one was really asking, hey, what happens when this baby tiger grows up? No one was asking like, wow, look at those feet. You're going to get pretty big. Or look at those teeth. What do you eat? Nobody was asking questions about what happens with an AI model once it gets bigger, once it grows up. And so red teams are exactly these people. We are the ones in the room that ask who could this hurt? How might this be bad? And as HR professionals, we are the best equipped <laughs> to ask these types of questions. So hopefully through the length of this panel, we'll get to hear both from the very specifically the HR side, but also maybe some, some tactical things we can do in red teaming. But it is more about really unlocking all the things we know about human resources and capital to help us build AI systems that don't hurt people. Um, it's a very noble cause, uh, but it's actually quite a critical one. Okay, that was beautiful. Just look at the chat. Everyone loves the tiger um, and the stuffed tiger analogy. But I love that you've already tied it so neatly to the future um, and how AI red teaming can impact it directly, which is you know, a big part of what the panel is about. Um, but before we get a, dive a little deep into exactly how red teaming happens and how, you know, it can it can be democratic. Everyone can be a part of it rather than people who um, who think they're not technical enough. I just want to um, talk a little bit about the challenges uh, because I think that's the first thing that comes to you know people's minds when they think about something like AI red teaming. So um, Kate, this question I'm going to pose to you, and I would love for you to just sort of feel free to dip into your organizational psychology background and talk a little bit about what you think are the primary challenges organizations face when they want to implement AI red teaming. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, no, I love the analogy. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, so when I think about implementation of something like this, one, I think that, um, and you all, we all know this, right? Being HR professionals and leaders, we're dealing with this all the time, but I think people, uh, there's oftentimes a big resistance to change. Um, we're talking about, you know, a lot of change impl implementation around AI. And I think people oftentimes will resist adopting AI or resist adopting red teaming uh, in general for fear of the unknown or, you know, concerns about job security, whatever it is. Uh, I was you know, recently talking with a friend, a colleague of mine over at, um, you know, big financial institution. And we were talking about, you know, they had just gotten hired on to do all of like AI strategy for this organization. And she was like, you know, Kate, it's so interesting. I, you know, people have been, you know, telling me for years and years and years, like, we want our systems to be faster. We want AI generated. We want things automated. We want all these things. And then when they come in to actually do it, it's like, wait, but I don't want to lose that. I don't want to lose the way I've, already, I've always done it. Right. And so even when people are like asking for it, asking for it, we still are, we are having to overcome this sense of loss. So that's one thing is just the change resistance that can be part of this. Um, the second I think is culture. Um, if your culture is not ready to uh, innovate or share critical feedback or is you know, highly risk adverse and we've got you know serious hierarchies, I see a lot of times those, those types of cultures will struggle with this type of implementation or this type of testing because it does require a level of critical feedback. Uh, so it, it's challenging. You have to be a little bit vulnerable in that innovation space. So having that culture, I think really does matter. 
Um, I would say the last thing though is I see it, uh, you know, stress and stress and burnout. Like it, it takes a lot of time and energy and focus. And I think AI right now is we're on like the, we are on the frontier, right? People are like, it is a race to the top to think about AI right now. And so everybody is like all, like all hands on deck. That is, that's kind of the mentality around testing AI. And uh, I just say that because I see a lot of folks, especially who are working in that space, um, it's like there's like a medical leave rotation. Like people are getting so burned out, so stressed out that there's this uh, this need to actually take like leave from it. So I, I say that because and this is what I've dedicated my career to. But like I think about like equip your leaders, equip your leaders. That is like the best way to overcome some of these challenges. Uh, how do you lead through change? How do you give and pull for feedback? How do you create the culture you want? How do you make sure you're having one on ones so that, you know, people are you know getting checked in on in terms of their stress levels? So those are some of the things that I see, at least from an organizational psychology perspective of that, that state of readiness, the challenges that might come into play. And uh, do you mind if I jump in? Yeah, yeah please, please do. Excellent. I just want to uh, build on one of the things that Kate says in particular is the the culture. And I think, you know, a big word that or a big concept that we're all already familiar with is psychological safety. And I think if you really want to make the most of red teaming, which, as I mentioned in the chat, you may not have done official red teaming, but you've done red teaming. Like <laughs> Red teaming is basically it is ferreting out the unintended consequences of an action. <laughs> <laughs> and as HR professionals, that is one of the things that we do best. Um, and so I think, you know, as you know, if you want people to put up a hand to say, hey, this is going to impact this group um, in, a, in a negative way, or hey, um, I think this isn't going to work as well as we think, you know, you need to have a culture that allows people to kind of speak truth to power. Um, so psychological safety, I would say, is a great one of one of the many great places to start, as Kate mentioned. Thank you so much, uh, Dan, for adding that. Um, and uh, as we often say, knowledge is power and helps dispel any kind of fear. Um, so I think to begin the process of um, creating some kind of psychological safety and uh, uh, maybe uh, resisting against this resistance to change, um, let's start the process of understanding what what AI red teaming entails. Um, and uh, Noel, again, I'd love for you to answer this. If you could just walk us through what the process is like, what steps are involved. Um, yeah, just enlighten us. Absolutely. Um, I think probably the, the most important thing, you know, oftentimes uh, if you, depends on the team that ends up initiating the red teaming activity. We are seeing now that a lot more of the business side of organizations are driving the creation of these teams, uh, which allows a much more inclusive set of people to show up usually. <laughs> um, but if the technical side of the organization is the one that drives it, we end up not getting as rich of a team together that can actually do some of these activities. So what are these activities? So number one, the job, and, and you can go back to kind of cybersecurity for, for this definition, but the job of a red team, just like Diane said, right, is to attack a system, like to, to make sure that you uncover its vulnerabilities. But in the new world where the main user interface for talking to a uh, an AI system is your voice, is natural language, uh, one of the most important things to do is to have a team that cares about certain key components, certain key elements. First, that key element is accuracy. Someone needs to be kind of holding the bar on, is this model accurate? precise? Does it know what it's doing? Is it getting the right information? Is it presenting it accurately? At Amazon Alexa, in the early days, we ended up building an accuracy review team. And their job was to ensure that, you know, the model didn't lie. And so you do need people that are going to constantly enforce the reinforce with the model what truth looks like. The second thing is around fairness and bias. You're going to need people. And I always say empathy, um, begets kind of bias, right? Like we, in order for us to really be able to identify bias in a system, often we need to, we, we often are victims of that bias ourselves. So people of color, people, um, women, like those who experience bias in systems, like we can see it when it shows up where others may not even recognize it if they see it in a, in a prompt or in a response, if they don't actually align with that 
perspective. And so that's why this diversity of perspective in the room is so critical because you will see something when the model responds that might not seem dip, might not seem offensive to someone, might not seem um, infringing on their rights. But as someone who is infringed on, as someone who feels disrespected, I can articulate that. And that goes right to Di what Diane was saying about psychological safety. Like in order for red teams to even function, they have to have a, a space where they can raise their hand and say, yes, I would like <laughs> to say something. I think this model is damaging. I think it's hurtful. I think it's unfair. I think it's not transparent enough and not get fired for that role, like not get fired for doing that work. So red team is, like I said, it's more of a way that you do things as opposed to a role that you get. Um, can you guys still hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Just checking. Cause I was hearing beeps and stuff and I was like, I hope I didn't just mute myself by accident. Um, but, but that gives you a kind of a framework to think about, right? Like who's going to, once a model, right? A baby tiger grows up once that baby tiger is going out into the world, who's going to make sure that the guardrails are in place? Who's going to make sure that the fence isn't broken, that the, the, you know, that what it's eating is healthy. Like who's going to take care of it. And this red team is the caregiver for these models. And it is a long-term activity. <laughs> so most companies do a little bit, they sprinkle a little red teaming on at the end and then their models become, I mean, I'll give you an example at Meta, right? Meta released a model blender about three last, I guess it was almost two years ago now, but they released a model and within three days, it became sexist, racist, and hurt people on purpose with zero input from a human. And that's where we come in, right? As the humans, specifically those in the HR space, right? We, our, our world is going to be very much, um, you know, what we can do, how we can impact people comes from our lived experience with humans. Now we can use that information to educate models to be more, more responsive to those human activities. Yeah. And uh, can I just add to what Noel Please do. I think I think some you highlighted something that is so 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 critical and something that often gets missed in organizations, which is making sure that leadership factors in the time and emotional labor of monitoring a model, or you know, I mean, just the same way that you would need to factor in time and emotional labor in monitoring any sort of interaction or scenario, um, and so I think. That's something that as HR professionals, not only are we uniquely poised to add value by saying, hey, here's here's what would be problematic, et cetera. But I would also say, particularly to prevent um, burnout and to set up your organization structurally for success, if you plan on using a lot of AI, you need to make sure that somebody has officially designated time, space in their workload <laughs> and compensation to be providing input Otherwise, these types of things slip through the cracks, as we well know from countless other examples of these things slipping through the cracks. Now, one thing I want to add is that there is a framework uh, that has been established not by academia, but by industry when it comes to building an AI red team. And just to give you a couple pieces of homework, um, Google... Microsoft, Amazon have all published their red teaming activities. So you can go and just read what they've done and they've done it, you know, it's like an article. So it's not like an academic paper that you'd have to have GPT read to you. Um, but it's important to realize that oftentimes, and yes, Stephen, uh, you make a great point uh, in the comments about like, you don't want people, this is why a diverse group is so important. You don't want people that are like all the way over here, um, and embedded in the problem they're trying to solve, being the ones that are testing the model. You want a completely arbitrary kind of extended third party. And again, HR is almost always this, this resource for a company. Like you represent kind of a view of the company that people in the company don't have of themselves. I also think it's really important when you're thinking about this um, is that AI red teaming often happens at the end of a project. It's often something that's thought of at the end. But when you think about it at the beginning, it allows you to frame your projects as an AI, at least an element of it is an AI safety system, that you're building a system of activities on top of anything you're doing with AI that includes what we already talked about, accuracy review and bias and fairness reviews and things like that, but also includes how do we make sure people are interacting with us in safe and responsible ways? How do we make sure that bad data doesn't get injected into our business? How do we, you know, so there's, there's 
in building an AI safety system, you not only have kind of human AI experience that you need to think about, but there's this concept of prompt engineering. Some of you know it. Um, this concept of building system prompts to make sure the model does what it's supposed to. That's one of the things that the AI red team will end up testing. Like, does the model do what it's supposed to? And can I get it to do things it's not supposed to? But all of these things sit in a, in a kind of policy driven environment that says we're only going to build projects that have this responsible way of, of uh, acting. And I think that that's a really critical thing to realize is you're not alone. You don't have to build this from scratch. There are many organizations that have openly shared how they're doing red teaming in their, in their own companies. Okay, yeah, great, great point, uh, both Diane and Noel. Um, and uh, since we've clearly touched on the fact that a team is a really important part of AI red teaming, um, and um, uh, uh, Diane, you spoke about how um, taking our time for it, uh, whether at the beginning um, or typically at the end, is uh, is essential um, to ensuring you know um, a good AI process um i want to ask you um from your experience of working working with various levels of organizations uh what are some tips or best practices that you have for assembling just just uh, for the part of the process where we assemble a red team um and maybe if you want to touch on what it's like for startups is that different from different from uh, bigger enterprises or other kinds of organizations mm -hmm. that would be great too yeah, happy to share. So I think, honestly, Noel really touched on some of the biggest things, um, which is diversity of perspective, right? The whole point is that you don't want the people who built the model to be the only ones looking at it. <laughs> um, and so what I would say um, is diversity of perspective. And, and for this, you can use a good old fashioned stakeholder map. Um, and what I would do is uh, stakeholder impact map uh, which is basically when you think about AI or whatever tool you're using, whether it be uh, kind of a boilerplate, you know, chat GPT or whether it's a custom AI tool, think about who is using, who is using it and who is touched by it, right? So that goes all the way from, for example, the person implementing it to the, for example, uh, new customer service reps who may be, you know, getting cases passed off to them from your chat bot to the customers themselves. Um, and you want to make sure that you have at least one representative from each of those groups on your red team, right? So think about that. And then I would add that layer that Noel also mentioned and Kate as well is don't just then think of, okay, you know, who's putting up their hand, et cetera, but also do we actually have a diversity of, um, you know, diversity of background, diversity of gender, diversity of age, diversity of nationality, um, diversity of neurodivergence, like all of these other things, if you can layer that on as well, that's really helpful. Um, the one thing I will add, and this is what, kind of to your question about scale, right? Like startup versus enterprise, um, clearly the size and dedication of your red team will also depend on the level of implementation that you're talking about. Um, but what I would also say is, Red teaming or getting someone involved in your red team could be as simple as a quick feedback touch point, right? So you also don't need to think that every single person needs to be in the room every single time to be a good red teamer. Um, it could just be, okay, here's our dedicated kind of task force red teaming, and your job is to go out and collect feedback uh, or potential, you know, jailbreak scenarios from this group. And your job is to get feedback on some of these responses from this group and so on and so forth. So when I talk about kind of this diversity of perspectives, it's not so much about identifying unicorns. It's more just kind of making that big long list of like, before we let the tiger out of its cage, as Noel said, um, what are we, you know, have we talked to all of the people in the circus <laughs> to make sure that no one's going to inadvertently get their hand bitten off? Um, uh, Dan, someone's also asked in the chat, and I think we can just take it up right now. If you could share um, an example uh, or, or a stakeholder map with us, maybe later, if you can pull yeah, it up. Yeah, maybe later. Uh, and yeah. like, I think uh, I can try to kind of verbally illustrate it just really quickly, but basically yeah. just think about kind of 
if you look at, and you, for example, go talk to a project manager of like the stages of implementation, right? So like there's creation, there's initial rollout, yeah. there's use, you know, you key user, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you just kind of map that out and then you kind of say, okay, who needs to be involved at what point? When should we get feedback um, at what point? So I can send an example along uh, following, but if you Google stakeholder map, um, any of those frameworks will work nicely for this. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, and um, uh, we'll, we, I want to come back in a bit to some more real world examples. But before that, um, to make it a little more relevant to audience here, Kate, uh, this one's for you. Um, I want to understand how HR professionals can leverage AI red teaming to to enhance career development and and also operational efficiency uh, within their organization. Yeah, I would be happy to speak to this. Uh, I think maybe I will split them into two. So I'll talk about maybe the operational efficiency piece and then uh, think about the career development aspect. So when I think about the operational efficiency piece, I think that this is crucial. Um, I also think that there are many ways that we can partner cross-functionally to uh, increase operational efficiency. I'll give some examples in terms of what I've seen or stories I've heard or people I've worked with, uh, organizations I've consulted with. Um, but so there was an um, organization I was working with, a large retail organization, and they were using red teaming to test um, AI powered resume screening tools. And they were a big organization. So this is definitely like big, big, big organization. But they created actual, like in the red teaming approach, they, they came to the HR team and they were like, hey, we need your help. The people that were designing this model, they were like, hey, we need your help. Um, essentially that that very you know, diverse group of people that we're trying to get, right? And the they said, hey, could you essentially create us some fictional resumes with you know subtle differences in those protected characteristics? Like, you know, for example, like names suggesting different genders or different ethnicities, right? So just getting a really diverse group of, of resumes together. And what they realized in testing this screening tool was that there was a massive bias toward candidates from specific universities. And so as HR was helping and partnering with this red teaming, they gave that feedback that to those people that were designing the algorithm, like, hey, this needs to be looked at. We need to be considering this. And so they were able to put more additional human oversight into that process. And in the end, it gave them a more diverse candidate pool. So that's one example of partnering with folks internally to help with that operational efficiency, where it's like, now we have better processes, uh, we have faster processes, but we're doing it through this approach of, of, of red teaming. Um, I, there are more examples I can get into, but uh, I would say uh, as I move into the career development aspect, I think this is probably one that I'm also just more passionate about, which is uh, like the more you use AI right now, the more you get involved in the red teaming conversations, uh, the more exposure you have, you're going to have more AI literacy, which I would say is like gold in this current ecosystem of career development and your employability. So the more you're exposing yourself to AI right now, the more literacy you will have. And that's going to be a differentiating factor for you in the coming years of your employability. Um, I would say also in terms of employability, you know, I think HR can oftentimes get a maybe get a bad rap that we're not like super strategic. And I think that this is an opportunity to have maybe a different conversation. And so to me, this is an opportunity to be at the table, to have a seat. So when you get involved in AI red teaming, you are able to sharpen so many of your skill sets. Uh, you're working with folks who have, uh, you know, detailed data analytics skills. And it's like you're working alongside folks. You're learning from them. You're, you're absorbing that. You're getting to work through project management skills, cross-functional communication skills, internal consulting skills, especially as you have such specific insights on human behavior and how that leads to organizational impact. So speaking from your perspective, but working cross-functionally on these red teams, especially around AI, is going to give you such a, a significant leverage in your own employability and career development. So I, I share that because I see those two as working hand in hand of as you help with the operational efficiency, you will become more employable. Um, perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Kate. Um, I think at this point, there's one question that I think uh, it'll be nice to just, I'm just going to pose it to all three of you. It's in the Q&A. Um, there's another one that we can take later, but there's one 
um, by Jesse, um, uh, where uh, Jesse talks about uh, their organization where people are using AI uh, for their job um, and it's accepted, but upper leadership is um, at the wait and see stage. Uh, uh, let's wait and then see. Uh, so everyone's using it in silos. Uh, so for this, Jesse asks, what advice would you give um, or any best practices that you recommend uh, so that they can be a cohesive environment where uh, AI is not being worked in silos, but everyone can kind of um, work on it together. It's not exactly AI that you being, but it's it's the same thing, right? Where everyone's involved in AI. Um, yeah. So yeah, and, um, any of you can take it. I'm, I'm happy to, to kick it off. And then I'd love to hear from the other panelists. Uh, so I think, so first of all, you're not alone in the wait and see stage. I think that is honestly the number one thing that we see when um, you look at leadership is like, I mean, as the, the previous speaker said, seven out of 10 CEOs are saying, yeah, this will transform the business, but we don't know how. And honestly, I think everyone is waiting kind of for a template to emerge. Um, and the reality is it is because of the unique nature of AI, AI offers kind of very personalized help um, and in some ways is the most impactful when applied on the individual level um, in many cases, which defies organizational templatizing. <laughs> um, and so what that means is I think that organizations that really thrive are the ones where you try to learn from the people who are who have embraced it successfully. Right. And so what I would say is on the very kind of low tech side is just ask around. Right. I mean, I think that's one of the things that a lot of people don't don't even think to do is just, you know, say, hey, I'm experimenting with AI. I found some cool stuff. Is anyone else? What are you experimenting with? What are the use cases that you've seen? Um, so first, I would just say is like first best practice is literally kick off the conversation um, because I I see a lot of people missing that step and because they're kind of expecting some sort of top down effort on this front when in reality AI adoption is a much more grassroots effort um, from what we've seen uh, in the way that it's being employed by by various teams. Um, I would also say this is a great opportunity, as Kate said, to kind of flex your decision maker muscle. Um, and what I mean by that is when you are in cross-functional scenarios and you do have a chance to, to bring up questions saying, hey, what is everyone else doing with AI? Right? We're thinking of starting to strategize with it in this way. What else are people, what else are other people doing? So again, it's, it's kind of similar to the first recommendation of, of kick off a conversation, but I would say kick off a conversation should be literally talk to anyone and everyone because you never know where you know, some of the best AI practitioners in your org could be on any level. And two, it would be initiate conversations in those cross-functional rooms, right? Um, even better is if you have a specific use case or impact story to share, uh, that can also kind of get the snowball going in a really positive way. And what I mean by that is it could be something as simple as uh, instead of Googling a template, I tossed it into ChatGPT and I ended up with something far more usable. Um, it saved me at least 30 minutes, right? Even those simple little impact stories can also start to help other people who maybe have not played around with it really start to understand, oh, wow, you know, 30 minutes here, 30 minutes there, you know, the mental fatigue of doing this, um, the burden lifted, all of those things really add up. Um, and kind of you modeling that can really make a huge difference, particularly when it comes to cross-functional adoption. Um, Jesse, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, I can, um, I'll build on top of that uh, as well. Uh, I think one of the things that I've seen be very successful, and I'll, I'll just speak from the experience I had last year, uh, in building um, what now is one of the largest generative AI practices uh, in one of the largest consultancies. Uh, but the way we did it was very grassroots. Uh, we ended up like no one was paid to do the work yet. So we were very siloed. Everyone was kind of off. I called it the worst form of shadow IT, right? Where like the, anyone could go and just start using this technology. Um, and, and we had policies, but Anyway, it was just, it was kind of the, it was the wild west. And so what we ended up doing was bringing people together. Of course, I, you know, I'm a big community builder. That's the skill I often bring as part of my tools kit 
uh, when I joined an organization, but I immediately sent a note out to my distro, which was everybody in my organization, all of data and AI. And I said, Hey, I'm going to get together every day for two weeks from six to 8 AM. And we're going to put our fingers on a keyboard and learn this stuff together. And that 40 people that showed up eventually by the end, we had 70, those 70 people ended up forming what we eventually called the center of excellence. That center of excellence ended up creating a lot of the practices and best practices and prompt repositories. Like we were willing to kind of do this stuff in our spare time as we, I don't say spare time, but we, we basically would do it that we weren't getting paid specifically to do that work, but to bring a community of people that were passionate about using the technology responsibly together in the company. As a result of that, I'm a huge believer in community. So I created my own. That's the, the, uh, I love AI community that you heard uh, at the beginning, but even in your own company, like you don't necessarily need to be an evangelist, but you'd be surprised how many people would be willing to join you on a Friday office hours that are across the organization. And that many of the best things start very small, some seemingly insignificant, but when you get together and you actually communicate across the board, you can share learnings. You can then make, make agreements on how you're going to document things. None of this has to be official. None of this has to be handed down to you from the CEO. It actually helps the business that you're communicating to each other. You create friends along the way. Many of the people that I did this with last year are my friends now, and we've all gone on to do, many of us have gone on to do other things uh, in the industry. So I think it's really important to, to recognize that one of the best and easiest things you can do is just create space for people who care about this problem to come together and communicate. And that might be called community. Maybe it's a Slack channel, doesn't really matter, but that's, that's kind of my perspective. Thanks, Noel. And I think this is a good place for us to drop a link to the EIHR Slack community. Um, uh, but jokes about, yeah, uh, Kate, did you want to add on to that as well? Um, or I, I would say just, from, yeah. yeah, just from a personal perspective, I've started using AI with a lot of different things, just even myself internally. And uh, you know, there hasn't necessarily been a mandate from the leadership or C-suite perspective of like, this is how we're using AI as an organization. And so I think using it without that, it can kind of almost seem like, you know, there's hesitation, like we're all tiptoeing, like, oh, should we be using this? Is, am I cheating if I write this in an email? Like, you know, like there's just all these question marks. And so I think like I've started using it and just explicitly saying, hey, here's how I used it in this project. Uh, I did a big like career pathing project internally and pretty much like it, like wrote a lot of code for AI and just was like, okay, cool. Like this is how I did it. Here were the prompts that I used. And so I think that there are, to me, the transparency has really broken down barriers because people not only can see the impact, but they can see the how. And it, I think it, it it kind of makes this feel more approachable. So I give that, I give that to you because uh, as you experiment, I think it frees other people to do that too. Um. Great. Uh, thank you so much. There are a couple of questions that I also want to take up from the audience. But before that, I just just picking up from something Diane said about, um, you know, case studies or impact stories and how they can be, um, they can really help people adopt AI and uh, um, create an impression. Um, I think at this stage, I would love to know from each one of you. But we can start with Diane if there are if there's a real world example about. Uh, AI red teaming, where it has probably significantly impacted uh, companies' operation or performance or building an AI tool. Uh, anything from your experience since you've uh, done so much on AI integration. Um, and then Kate and Noel, if you want to give an example, that's, that'll be great too. I would love to kick it off. And then I know like Noel in particular is the, the queen of this. So I'll save a lot of time for her. Um, uh, I also wanted to just plus one what Kate was saying I, and what Noel was saying about just making AI visible in an organization. One of the most powerful um, interventions that I've seen really effective is the simple act of a team leader in a meeting. It could be any meeting, literally sharing their screen, opening up ChatGPT or Claude or Gemini and just saying, let's type something in and see what happens. And just that act of kind of modeling experimentation can often be the domino that one allows people who have been using AI to kind of raise their hand and be like, oh my gosh, have you tried this? Have you tried this? Have you tried this? And two, it just sets that tone of saying, hey, this is something that we're experimenting with and exploring. Um, so 
just wanted to share that. Um, yeah, so the example that comes to mind is uh, there was a team at Uber who was looking to roll out an AI assistant to handle kind of HR related questions, right? The kinds of things that we all have answered millions and millions of times. How long is my leave? What's the website for benefits again? You know, like all of that stuff that we've, we've all come to those kinds of um, tedious questions. Um, and their version of red teaming was basically they went to various groups. One, first and foremost, they identified even before deploying, they went to the groups and they said, what are the no-fly zones? What are things that we do not want this chatbot to talk to people about, right? Um, and so, for example, employee relations, right? Someone reporting, I don't know, sexual harassment. They were like, we don't want a bot dealing with that. Um, that's too sensitive. We need to make sure that the bot is trained to immediately refer to a human being, right? And they made kind of this long list of those scenarios and, and had that as kind of a key, a key um, parameter in evaluating kind of the, the success really of the answers. Um, the other thing that was really interesting is they actually worked with the teams who currently handled a lot of these questions to try to come up with break the bot scenarios. Um, and so they, you know, used a lot of these customer service reps and HR people to say, hey, like, what are some of the most common questions? What are the most outlandish? What are, what are things that um, a new customer service rep gets confused about? Um, that was kind of a really interesting way to like get at where maybe a machine might. Now, granted, machines and humans might get confused about different things, but I thought that was really useful. Um, and one of the things that was really interesting and where I think one of the biggest impacts came was, yes, they save time and, and so on. But what, by red teaming, they also identified a really glaring error, which is that this model, which had been trained on internal Uber policy and documentation, had very inconsistent information when it came to international policy. Um, because a lot of the customer service reps would refer to, I don't know, the UK family leave website or the US COBRA guidelines or whatever it was, um, if they were asked questions about this stuff. And so they, by realizing that, that, you know, okay, if it was asked about policy that was external to Uber was government policy, but that employees would still often come to HR for, um, they needed to fill in the gaps in the model. Um, and they did. And I think one of the biggest impacts is it potentially saved Uber, I mean, not only employee frustration, but millions in lawsuits. Because if an employee reaches out and says, hey, you told me that I could take 12 weeks of paid family leave, um, and I did, and it turns out that that was wrong because my country doesn't offer that and you know it was supposed to be subsidized by the government or whatever, um, that can cause real headaches um, from both a employee experience perspective, but also even a regulatory perspective. Um, so that was an, a good example of where I think by doing the red team and doing the due diligence, uh, it allowed them to unearth something that um, potentially would cause even greater HR headaches than it would solve. So, yeah. Um, before, uh, uh, sorry, just to hold that thought, Kate and Noel. Um, what I really loved about your example was it also um, harps back to what Noel said about how red teaming is not something that has to be at the end. Because clearly Uber um, thought about that, uh, it had to be at the beginning, but you have mm -hmm. to kind of keep that in the loop when you're building something. Um, so yeah, just like a lovely little connection. Uh, but yeah, um, Noel and Kate, if you'd like to quickly add something. Okay, I'll go, Kate, <laughs> then you could go. Um, so this is actually really great timing because I got some very exciting news that I get to share with you all first. I just got an email just now saying um, that I got awarded the MVP, uh, Microsoft MVP this year, which is super exciting, but they created a new category for responsible AI, which is so amazing. So it's really kind of cool, <laughs> like, oh my gosh. Um, but as a result of that, I think, you know, my experience actually I was going to talk to you about is about the work that the responsible AI team has done at Microsoft. And it goes back to something that I care really a lot about. Um, one is accessibility, right? And, and I have, of course, a son who has Down syndrome. And so I'm very kind of forward thinking about like, how do we make sure this 
technology we're using doesn't leave people behind. So when I'm participating in any kind of red teaming like activity, meaning that my um, use of a model is allowing me to uncover things that people likely haven't thought about because I'm thinking about it through the perspective of my son. Um, it It's very, like, I was very happy to find out that the Microsoft, you know, when you go and use a model like Azure OpenAI service, for example, I went and spent a couple of days with that team and they, they have, of course, a, a very significant red AI red team, but that red teaming effort coordinates very closely with research and that research team coordinates very closely with academia and it creates this extremely rich ecosystem of perspectives that's very hard to replicate right like if you can think about you need people who understand the business that's us that's the hr professionals right that are listening here but then it's us plus those who know how to build the models the technologists then it's us plus those who have been researching the impact this has on humanity for decades. Like all those people need to be in the room at some point in time to, to have this conversation. And so I, a lot of the new features that came out of Microsoft's Azure uh, content filtering, which is their safety system, one of the key features came out of a bunch of the academics, the researchers at Microsoft Research, and the product owners at Microsoft sitting at a table going, what's the worst that could happen? And that's, I actually think Kate might have some, some perspective on this, but nobody wants to be like Debbie Downer or like negative Nelly. Like nobody wants to be the one who's in the room always being like, hey, by the way, and HR has a bad rap already. <laughs> it's like bringing surface things that are maybe uncomfortable, human communications. This is actually an opportunity to really shift that to build solutions in the company that are safer and more responsible. So I just wanted to mention that one super exciting announcement, but also my work with the Microsoft AI team was a really good example of how they've created relationships in maybe further, you know, places that they wouldn't naturally have gone to, right? Academia, Stanford, MIT, bringing in, you know, their Microsoft research all in the same room with the people that are actually driving go to market for an AI product. I just think that that's a really good example of the kind of exposure we should look uh, to have in our model as early in the development process as possible. Thank you so much, uh, Noel. And uh, thank you so much, Diane, as well. Also, thank you for answering some of the questions in the Q&A. Uh, we are running out of time and we have to move on to the next session. So just to wrap up, um, one short phrase, for a tip, like like an advice or a tip that you'd like to give everyone who's looking to implement AI red teaming effectively. So if you have to just like the shortest, concise, crispest phrase in which you could, um, you know, deliver it. Um, yeah, I know I'm putting you on the spot here, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, I can kick off. Um, I'm going to flip the script a little bit. Start referring to the normal checks and balances that you do in HR as red teaming. I think one of the things that I found particularly empowering when it comes to adopting AI is just if you use the language of AI, eventually you start to grow your own confidence, which leads to further adoption, et cetera. So we're all red teamers here. Uh, my piece of advice, honestly, and this just sits as the, at the intersection of kind of organizational psychology, but uh, I would say like, really do what you can to coach and equip your leaders to be having these conversations with their teams um, and think about uh, it really equipping them to lead through changes like this and uh, make sure that they have the leadership skills necessary to, to, to navigate and lead through change. And then really quickly, I guess we got less than a minute. Um, I echo both of those things, but I'd also include get your fingers on a keyboard, Diane and Kate both mentioned like the importance of actually being present in this space. And the best way to do that is to join these communities. I learn by doing, I like to do projects. I like to put my fingers on a keyboard, prompt a model. Um, and so I put my community in the chat. You're welcome to join. It's free, but we do a lot of live learning. We actually have some community members in the audience. So, hey, what's up? Um, but it's really great opportunity to learn as you go. So hopefully that is helpful, but definitely just start implementing, like get into the business of talking to machines <laughs> if you're not doing so already. Great, thank you so much all three of you. As you can see, uh, we've already had a pretty impactful session. Uh, the polls had around 70% people 
selecting crucial as uh, their uh, consideration of how important AI red teaming is um, for any organization. So thank you once again, Kate, Dan, and uh, Noel. You were amazing. We had so much to learn. 